biggest challenge that you're facing in India or that you anticipate facing in India? Commodity prices and all of that, the volatility is a global phenomenon. Sure. But particularly with regards to your growth in India, what do you foresee as sure. being your biggest challenge? You know, I don't worry too much about all these challenges. Uh, people say, do you sleep at night? I always sleep very well um, because I don't worry so much. A lot of the things that we deal with, be it input costs, uh, be it uh, competitive activities, we've done that, we've seen that, they come and go, mm. that's part of our business. What I worry about most is the talent base, to be sure that we are always the preferred employer, that we attract and train and, re re uh, and retain the best people, because ultimately that is going to guarantee the long-term future. Mm. I don't worry too much about the few years that I'm CEO either. What I need to be sure of, and Harish and others, is that we leave this company much stronger than when we found it. And that can only be done by getting your talent base up. So for example, we are a 40 billion euro company now, which is not a small company. In fact, last year we grew 11%, which is more than 4 billion incremental euros, which yeah. is in India, by the way, bigger than in India, that we grew last year. Bigger than half of the FTSE 100 companies. But I need to have the people on the payroll, or we need to have the people on the payroll that are already 80 billion euro people mm. before our business is there. So we spent a disproportionate amount of time on talent. I cannot help you with any plans on how to do Lifebuoy, or how to better sell Sunsilk, or how to uh, make our Knorr brand bigger, yeah. because we have tremendous amount of expertise with people that know India better. But we can be sure that we have the right talent for a long term future. A quick follow up question since you're such a firm believer in equitable growth and social responsibility. What the Indian government is hoping to do at this point in time is pass through a company's bill which will make 2% spend of your annual profits mandatory for corporate social responsibility or towards corporate social responsibility. Where does uh, HUL or Unilever stand on this? Yeah, so I'm, I'm familiar with a lot of the initiatives going on at government level or not in one form or another, but my philosophy is we spend 100%. That is our business model. When we um, do our hand washing campaigns with Lifebuoy here, mm. every six seconds a child dies from diarrhea, disinfectious diseases. By getting people to wash hands, we have uh, hand wash campaigns of, of hundreds of millions of people. So you're okay with the government making it mandatory? Well, I would go farther than that. You see, a lot of companies operate under the law. Corporate governments stay also obviously on the right side of the law, and that's important. Then some companies become a little bit more philanthropic. Mm. Then some companies go to cost-related marketing and link it to a brand. Then you get CSR. Where, where you often have a CSR officer, you have a, a, yeah. a category, you do 2% yeah. type things. Yeah. We are on a different planet already. We are on a business model that is a sustainable business model, where everything we do is around improving the health, nutrition, uh, sustainable growth, ensuring that the total value chain benefits from where we are. We're on, a, on level 5 as I call it. Okay. So the 2% is for companies that have to catch up with what we're trying to do. Okay. I, I, I want to put in a quick question here on you know, brand and building brands in this FUCA world. And, 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 and I remember you saying uh, that you think that there will be a trend back towards fewer brands and towards bigger brands. There will be a premium on fewer, bigger global brands. Is that going to be the way forward as far as Unilever is concerned? Uh, and we see that. It's not obviously See, in a country like India, you might have, when, uh, uh, where the regions are so big, you might have entrepreneurs that try to bring in a bar soap, and, and there are thousands of those doing that. But at the end of the day, uh, in an uncertain world, the consumers look for anchors, anchors of trust. And increasingly, uh, people or, or institutions or systems around them are failing. Mm. Uh, the image of politicians or, or uh, others are at rel relatively low levels. And the trust in brands is actually, uh, brands well managed and well done, is, is going to be an increasing premium. I want to end by asking you uh, a final question. And I remember reading somewhere, you said, I hate to have the day when I pass on and people talk about me building market share. I'd rather have them talk about me making a difference in society. So you don't want to be known as the best CEO Unilever had. You just want to be known as a nice guy. Well, you know, if you look at the, um, that's, that's your translation of it, it's not exactly <laughs> what I tried to say there. Let me, let me explain what I tried to say, that's how the benefit of being on a podium, I get, I get a little bit more time than just a, a sound bite in a newspaper. But um, if you look at any company that has a long history and you go back to the CEOs or, or the senior managers in that company, very few people knew how well the company was doing at that time in terms of market share or profits. These numbers come and go. 
and obviously we focus on these for the long term health of a company but if we in life what drives people and I think that's why you're all here and that's why we have the wonderful charity as well and why we have such great people making this all possible if you can say I grow and and uh, during my journey in life I've made a difference and I leave things better than that I found them either I've touched people or uh, strengthened an organization I've created things that are benefiting for many generations to come I've shown a business model that everybody would benefit from mm. that that gives us a world that is more equitable you've made a difference and I think that is far more important in life than to worry about the short-term numbers huh? obviously if you focus on that making a difference I've become convinced for my 30 years at least working that the numbers automatically will come it's for that reason that a company like Unilever has stopped giving long-term guidance we've now stopped giving quarterly reporting we actually say we don't want some of our shareholders and we say very firmly we focus on the consumer if we focus on the consumer our employees the communities in which we live and work and do that very well with passion with purpose with positive attitude I have no doubts that the numbers will come we want our company to be focused on the right drivers for the long term mm. and we certainly can satisfy the financial world by doing that as well if you can achieve that and say I've contributed to that and I made a small difference mm. I think you can say you've left the you've lived a good life so I'm yeah. going to ask you to prioritize uh, the attributes of a CEO or a business leader integrity long-term vision caring demanding what would the pecking order be of these attributes integrity 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 you're not demanding boss integrity <laughs> <laughs> it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Many thanks for joining us here. The event concluded with a vote of thanks by Madhvi Puri Butch, CEO ICICI Securities and founder Tufels Foundation. The Tufels Foundation also pledged a donation of a significant amount to an NGO of Mr. Polman's choice. He was then felicitated with tokens of appreciation by Prerna Langa of ICICI Foundation, Professor Uday Salonke of Wellinger Management School, Professor Ramesh Kharwad of the National HRD Network as well as Sharmila Faranjpe and Anita Sahu of Tufels Foundation.